Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. In this episode, we talk to author Tim Lo, whose book Where Song Began has been credited with turning the map upside down in terms of ornithology's northern hemisphere bias, and we'll learn what that means when we talk to Tim. Tim proves that the world's cleverest birds and the most distinctive birds originated in Australia. Tim Lowe is an award-winning author, biologist, consultant, and speaker. You can read more about him at his website, timlow.com, which we will link to. And um, But I know we're all eager to hear about Australian birds and what makes them unique and Tim's thoughts on ornithology in general. So Tim Lowe, thank you so much for being part of the Bird Podcast. Thank you, Shobha. Thank you for your interest. It's great to be talking with you. So we discussed how um, it's difficult to get your book here in India, which yeah. we hope to rectify soon. <laughs> but for those who haven't read the book, um, can you tell us about its broad themes and ideas? Yeah, so there's really two themes. One is um, Australia's got very distinctive birds. Why is that? And the other is um, the role of Australia in actually contributing birds to the rest of the world. So uh, <clears throat> we now know from, there's DNA evidence that established this, but it's backed up by fossil evidence as well that Australia gave the world its songbirds and its parrots. And so if you think of songbirds as nearly half the world's birds, it means that um, you know every sunbird or bulbul or crow that you see in India, it had an Australian ancestor. And that's also true of say the ring-necked parrots. So um, yeah, that's uh, something that has been a really big surprise because of, it had always been assumed that birds would have come out of the Northern Hemisphere, but these two really important groups came out of Australia. Um, and you do this in your book, but tell us the story of how it came to be that these birds, or where did they come from and how did they um, migrate and move? Well, if you're talking about, say, the parrot, parrots and the song, the um, songbirds, um, it's really a matter of, um, well, the, the DNA evidence. I mean, if you look at bird anatomy, I mean, say if you compare birds with mammals, I mean, mammals, they vary so much in form. You know, if you think of a mouse, an elephant, a bat, a whale, there's so much variation in the form of those birds, of, of those mammals. But then when you get to birds, because most of them can fly, there's nowhere near as much variation. You know, they, they don't have horns. Um, there's a lot of conservatism in the, in the form of birds. And so to understand the relationships, and people thought that in Australia, we talk about having wrens and babblers, um, warblers. A lot of the English names that were used in Australia we used for birds that were thought to be related to the similar birds in um, Asia, Europe, and other continents. But when DNA um, methods became sophisticated, it was realized that they weren't related at all. And that once you, um, I, mean, it's a bit, I do explain this in a talk, I explain it much better in the book. In the book. But if you um, to get a, a DNA tree, if you look at the branching pattern of birds, you find that, uh, say the crows, swallows, bulbuls, all, all the um, songbird groups that are found around the world, that they are nested within Australian birds. So that um, the, um, oh, it's so, <laughs> it's, it's so hard to explain this without pictures too. But um, the way you, um, I mean, people have seen phylogenetic trees. So if you say, if we go to primates and think of apes, you know, that humans have, chimpanzees and bonobos as our closest relatives, then gorillas come next, then orangutans, then gibbons. And so that kind of phylogenetic tree, it's evolutionary distance that, you know, our DNA is nearly the same as that of a chimpanzee and a bonobo. It's quite a bit more different to a gorilla, quite a bit more different to orangutan. And so you end up drawing them with the, the line linking humans with chimpanzees and bonobos first than orangutan second. Now, if you do that with songbirds, you find that, um, let's say, you know, all, all of, say, the bulbuls in Asia, that, they all, in Africa, they all group together. But then if you try and say, well, what 
are the um, songbirds that are most different from those, you end up with a whole series of Australian songbirds. So lyrebirds, scrub birds, tree creepers, bowerbirds. If you look at those four groups of Australian birds, they are songbirds, but they are massively genetically different from the songbirds that you will see on the other continents. And so that is evidence that they diverged first from the songbirds that you'll find around in the rest of the world long, long before bulbuls diverged from sunbirds and um, swallows diverged from crows. That <clears throat> You know, you might look at a swallow and a crow and think, well, I know they are songbirds, but they're incredibly, incredibly different. But the actual distance genetically between them is much smaller than the distance between a lyrebird, an Australian lyrebird, and any other songbird, or an Australian bowerbird and any other songbird. So there, there are these massive genetic distances that you find in Australian birds, and this is matched with morphology. So if you look at the, the song, the voice boxes, the syrinxes of our, these early songbirds, and also if you look at the fossil evidence. So if you look at the Miocene um, um, songbird fossils, so if you go back in time, so we're now in the Holocene, you go back Ply Pleistocene, Pliocene, then Miocene, you can find songbird fossils from around the world, but they're all really weird. Unless you come to Australia and you can find that we had these really early lyrebirds, um, uh, log runners, some of these really, these are the oldest fossils that we have of songbirds where you can say, I know what that is. That's in a group that we still have today. They're all Australian. So the oldest genera of living songbirds all come from well, it's all one site in northwest Queensland. We don't actually have that many bird fossil sites in Australia. Part of the reason why I think your book, I think book created so many waves is because it's counterintuitive. So you're saying that because they are so different, they began in Australia. Yeah, that's right. So we, we have more diversity of songbirds in Australia than anywhere else. And you can tell it with bird calls. So if you look at um, the, our, our um, honey eaters, they've got really, really harsh calls. So when John Gould, the great English naturalist, came to Australia to study our birds, he talked about the horrible, horrible calls of some of our birds. I mean, we've got a um, wattle bird, the yellow wattle bird in Tasmania. It's calls being described to the sound of someone vomiting violently. Just, Bleh! it's a real, Bleh! it's just a horrible, horrible call. And this is a songbird. I mean, it's just awful. But then on the other hand, we have the, the lyrebird, which, um, I mean, you can, anyone can easily go online and listen to, you know, through YouTube, listen to a lyrebird. And that just knocks out a nightingale. It knocks out any other beautiful singing bird. I mean, it, it really is the world's best um, songbird. So you can say in a sense, we've got the world's most awful sounding songbirds and the most melodious, most richly um, complicated and beautiful songbird calls in the one country. And that is one way of knowing that we have this incredible diversity. And the reason we have this incredible diversity is that songbirds have been in Australia much longer than anywhere else. So they've just had the time to diversify, to go off in all these directions. So if you think of how come Australia has these bower birds, you know, these really strange birds that are building these um, bowers, New Guinea, the birds of paradise. I mean, New Guinea is really just a, it's part of the Australian continent and it really belongs with Australia. And so why is it that we have li uh, lyre birds, bower birds, um, um, birds of paradise? that are doing such incredibly different things, they've had more time in Australia to evolve in different directions. Uh, in one of your articles, which I read, you talked about, I think it was the Hotson, which is a, an order that goes back and it has one species, whereas the past, yes. the, and then you say the songbirds are about 56% of the world species. And you, you differentiate between passerines and songbirds and, um, you say they're yeah. It's important. It's important to make that difference. So I mean, I've seen the Indian pitta. So the p 
Peters, uh, the Peters and Broadbills are the two groups of subossines that you'll see in Asia. And um, okay, so if we get back to the difference between perching birds and songbirds, some bird people will use the two words as if they are the same. It's not really good to do that because if you look at the perching bird order, order Passeriformes, there are three groups within that order. And that one the oldest group are the New Zealand wrens. There's only two, two of these species left. Then you have the sub -ossines. They're mainly in South America. So they, if you uh, have bird watched in South America, all the flycatchers, very big group. Some of those are in North America. Uh, so the North American flycatchers, these are perching birds, but they are not songbirds. So they don't learn their songs. The song, well, actually a few of them do. It's, <laughs> biology is full of exceptions. Once you get out of um, South America has lots and lots of sub signs. North America has a few, they've moved up. When you get into Asia and Africa, well, Asia, you've got broadbills and the pitters. And Africa, you only have the African broadbills. So the sub signs in um, Europe doesn't have any. Um, but yeah, it's really important to discriminate between an Indian pitter. It's a perching bird, but it's not a songbird. I mean, it's a very monotonous call. That, you know, if you listen to an Indian pitter, you're not getting the music or the, I mean, okay, crows are songbirds without music, but they have very complicated calls. And so um, it looks, the pattern that, look, the pattern that you get is you, if you go back to Gondwana, if you go back um, 80 million years, Africa had left Gondwana, India was moving north, it's striking into Asia and pushing up the Himalayas. But if you look at the rump of Gondwana, you have Antarctica, still green, full of forests, full of birds, and South America. <clears throat> and you get the um, perching birds and the parrots. So parrots are the birds that are closest to the perching birds. No one knew that until the genetic evidence, but they're smart, two smart groups of birds. And so as Gondwana, these three, there's uh, Australia, Antarctica, South America breaking apart, <clears throat> and New Zealand comes in there too. You get the New Zealand wrens get stranded in New Zealand. The sub -ossines, they take over South America. Perching birds take over, or sorry, the songbirds take over Australia, and they start leaving again and again. And so you get waves of songbirds moving out of Australia and becoming really successful in the rest of the world. Um, this is fascinating. One way I think for us to understand it is if you talk about the, the Australian birds that are there in your book um, and, and, and use them as examples. For example, in your book, you talk, we gather that they are intelligent, they're aggressive, they're loud, live in complex societies, and are long-lived. Now, each of those is is uh, could uh, I mean, if you could address each of them, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, you're you're asking me to summarize a half of a book in in a short talk, so I'll, I'll do what <laughs> I can. Okay, so we know that in terms of bird intelligence, for a long time it was thought that birds were not smart. You know, people thought. It's mammals that are smart. And it's because the areas of the brain that are evidence of intelligence in mammals, birds don't have those parts of the brain well developed. And so that was a big mistake to think that because birds didn't have this, the same part of the brain that signifies intelligence in mammals, therefore they weren't intelligent. Now, anyone who's a bird watcher is smart enough to know that that's not true, that you know, crows are really smart, parrots are really smart, and that bird intelligence reaches its peak in large songbirds and large parrots. And they are the two groups that we now know from DNA evidence. Both came out of Australia. And if you look at, um, obviously mammals reach higher levels of intelligence than birds. So humans, chimpanzees, we are, we are smarter than the smartest birds. But it's really interesting if you look at when did apes and humans become really intelligent. It was only a few million years ago. And if you look at the evidence of 
um, when were there large parrots in Australia? It's much earlier in time. So I think that if aliens were visiting planet Earth, say 15 or 20 million years ago, saying, where, where is intelligent life on planet Earth? They wouldn't find any apes or they wouldn't find you know, big apes with big brains and that the greatest, highest levels of intelligence would have been in parrots in Australia and New Zealand and, and in large songbirds. And so, so that's, that's why I talk about intelligence. And, I mean, there, there are now large, I mean, crows are on most continents and they are very, very smart birds. Um, but Australia actually has more very large songbirds than any other continent. So we have a lot of big, smart birds. Um, and then when you get to parrots, Sorry, we have if I a lot of big parrots. What are the names of these large songbirds for? Uh, well, we have the Australian chuffs is uh, yes. one. Lyrebirds. Lyre um, so we've got two species of lyrebird. I mean, they are the, I think they're the third largest, I think our superb lyrebird is the third largest songbird. So there are two species of raven that are larger, including the Eurasian raven. Then um, bowerbirds. So <clears throat> bowerbirds, are, a, whole, a lot of our bowerbirds are quite large. Some of them we call catbirds. They're still bowerbirds. They're big birds. We have some really big honey eaters. So some of our, and that's really unusual. You know, you think of nectar feeding birds tend to be very small, some birds, hummingbirds. We've got really chunky, big um, um, uh, honey eaters. And um, oh, we've got um, a large orioles, fig birds. It's quite, quite a, quite a, oh, okay. quite a big Sorry, bird. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. 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 And we had Jennifer Ackerman as a guest on the podcast and her, she talked about her book about the bird intelligence. So, uh, so we. Yeah. And she, she, she visited me and I showed her. Yeah. Yeah. I showed us yeah. Australian honey eaters. I'm not, not far from my house. Yeah. Ah, okay. So that, so sorry, I interrupted. You were talking about intelligence and then aggressive. Yeah, okay. Aggression. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So aggression is a big one. Okay. So. Um, parrots, large parrots, they tend to be aggressive. And I mean, the parrot bill, it's very powerful. You know, if you can crush a nut, you think, well, what could that bill do if it bites into another bird? So parrots are quite dangerous birds and other birds don't want to get too close to parrots. And, you know, we've got all these cockatoos, really, really loud calls. You know, you know that the sulfur crested cockatoos, they are incredible screams and they, they actually roost. I, I've got a fantastic house where I have, there's a little hill just outside here and I have um, sulfur crested cockatoos roost here at night. So I hear them screaming. I have corellas, they're another large cockatoo. They scream at night. It's fantastic acoustics here. But yeah, you don't want to mess around with these parrots. So, so that can be, they're not aggressive in the sense that they don't go around attacking other birds. But if there's a feeding tree and they're feeding in there, um, you don't want to get close to them. I mean, actually, probably more aggressive are the, I mean, on the international edition of my book is rainbow lorikeets. So these are much smaller parrots. I mean, these are all through Australian cities and they feed on nectar in particular. And the honey eaters also want the nectar. And you can have amazing aggression between honey, honey eaters and um, lorikeets because Nectar, it's the easiest food of all to find. I mean, if, it, if a tree has got flowers on it, that's not like hunting for insects. I mean, if you think of flowering trees, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of eucalypt trees, you know, visited, um, um, what is it in the south? Uh, the Nilgiris has a yeah, lot the of Yeah, the Nilgiris, Uti Komun. Yeah, so, you know, I went there a long time ago and saw all the eucalypts. Well, you'd know that when those trees are flowering, if, if you're a bird looking for insects, you've got to work to find insects. You know, you've got to look in and under leaves. And if you've got a big flowering eucalypt, the food's right there, the nectar, it's just staring at you in the face. You don't need to be smart to find it, but a lot of birds are going to want that nectar. And so if you want that nectar, it helps to be aggressive. So nectar is a highly defendable resource. If a, if a eucalypt tree is in flower all at once in Australia, we will get all these parrots and honey eaters 
cheating in that tree and they are aggressive, amazingly aggressive because they found it. It's the big, big aggressive birds that will be able to commandeer that nectar. So um, there's a lot of, in Australia, a lot of trees producing nectar more than anywhere else in the world. And that it is in these places that we see enormous amounts of aggression because, um, yeah, it, it's a defendable resource. I'm, I'm trying to understand the link you are making from aggression. So you're saying uh, Australia, Australian birds are distinctive because they are aggressive. And the, but does that mean European birds are not aggressive? What, or that Australia, uh, it, it began in Australia because birds in Australia are aggressive and then they became less aggressive as they, uh, so what is the thesis that we are defending here? Yeah, okay, so um, this is another major theme of the book. So the question, this is going back to the first question, why are Australian birds distinctive? And a good place to start is, if you look at the main groups of nectar feeding birds outside Australia, in North and South America, it's hummingbirds. And these are the smallest of all birds. So they feed on flowers, but they are tiny. And the flowers they feed on, they're usually red and they have little tubular flowers. Once you go to Asia and Africa, it's sunbirds. Sunbirds are the main nectar feeding birds. And these are also very, very small, very small birds. They can be very aggressive. Hummingbirds can be very aggressive. Hummingbirds will fight to defend their flowers. So you get, you'll get high levels of aggression. And spider hunters, I mean, they can be extremely aggressive. I don't know if that's true so much in India, but certainly um, in Borneo, I've seen um, extreme aggression among spider hunters. Um, and, it's, and it's because if you have a flowering bush, you don't have to work to get your food. The food is right there. The flowers, they'll keep secreting nectar. If you are a real bully bird, you can just sit there and drive away other birds and your food is sitting right there. Now in Australia, if you look at where do the birds get the most nectar, we have the eucalypts. And as you, you know, if you've looked at the eucalypts in Southern India, when they've got nectar, I mean, that's a lot of food. Bulbuls will go for that. And these are much larger birds than sunbirds, but because the eucalypts have got open flowers, it's not a little tube, any bird can get that nectar. And so I, what I say in my book is that because parrots developed an interest in feeding on nectar very early on, the eucalypts, the paper barks, a whole lot of Australian plants, they developed open flowers, flowers that instead of being little tubes that you will get for hummingbirds and and um, sunbirds, the, the nectar is quite, quite open and accessible because the parrots will just chew into a tube of flower. They'll ruin the flower. They won't be good at cross-pollination. They'll damage the stigmas. And so um, you have, if you look at the structure of a eucalypt flower, that is a flower suitable for birds, but it's nothing like a typical sunbird or hummingbird flower. It's open. I mean, you do get open um, sunbird flowers in Asia, but not to the same extent as Australia. And so these open flowers, you don't have to be small to use these flowers. So uh, honey eaters have been able to grow, become quite large birds. And so when John Gould, and I know John Gould had a strong association with, um, with India, you know, with, with hummingbirds, and, uh, sorry, with sunbirds and so on. I mean, he was <laughs> visiting a lot of countries and he talks about visiting Tasmania and seeing yellow wattle birds. So this is the largest honey eater in Australia. And he said, they're as big as English magpies. And so you're talking about a bird that is, uh, nectar is very important in its diet and it's as big as an English magpie. And of course that same magpie is in Asia and North America. And so we have these enormous nectar feeding birds and that aggression is a really big part of how they operate because if you've got a flowering eucalypt, there's enough food there for, the next, for you for the next month, as long as other birds don't come and take the nectar away. So these birds, they'll spend a lot of their time attacking anything smaller than them so that the nectar is theirs. But then if parrots turn up, their beaks are so dangerous that you get a standoff. And so you can stand under a eucalypt in Australia 
and just see amazing fights going on, just non-stop aggression fighting. And it is loud. It's just screaming, get away from my flowers. No, I want those. And then when night comes, if it's in the northern half of Australia, you've got fruit bats coming and flying foxes. So we have bats coming in to take the nectar as well. And they're also fighting among each other. So um, the idea that many of us have that nectar feeding birds are like hummingbirds or sunbirds is, uh, is turned upside down in Australia in a sense. Well, it, in a, only in the sense of size. In yeah. terms of social yeah. dynamics, it's the same. So I remember at university um, studying um, aggression, inter, interspecific aggression, where one species of bird attacks another species of bird. And the examples they gave were Hawaiian honey creepers, which are very small nectar feeding birds. And you, you do get, like I've talked to American bird watchers, I've said to Americans, what are your most aggressive birds? And they've said hummingbirds. So, so the, the aggression, and you say, well, why? Why should the aggression be there? And it is because it doesn't take any skill to find nectar. If there's a lot of, if there's a shrub that's got lots of flowers, it's, it's, it's much easier to find a shrub or a tree with flowers than it is to find little caterpillars hidden among foliage. And so if you if you're a bird that lives on insects, you can't afford to be aggressive. You have to spend all your time looking for little caterpillars and moths and things hidden among the leaves. If your main food is nectar, it's very easy to find flowers. They, they, have, they usually have bright colours. There's often a lot of them together. And so the, to have that resource as yours, it's not about being so the effort of searching. It's about defending it. It's about saying, okay, I found this flowering shrub. For the food to be mine, I have to drive away any other bird that wants it. Do you think the foliage changed bird behavior or bird? I mean, one of the fascinating things in your book is how the birds changed Australian ecology. And that was going to be a later question, um, but uh, we can, we, uh, maybe we come to the bird distinctions first. You say they're long lived and live in complex societies as, as if it's somehow different in Australia. Is it? Okay, so you, <laughs> yes, yes it is. Okay. so. This is going back to your first question about yes. yeah, <laughs> aggression, et cetera, and the, the, other, the other parts of the question. Okay, yeah. so in terms of long-lived, I mean, we've found from banding studies that Australian songbirds are very long-lived. So um, I think part of that is um, the comparisons are often made between European birds and birds everywhere else. And so if you think about the science of ornithology, it's developed in England, in Germany, in Scandinavia. These are fairly cold places. And so when they start banding their, their tits and um, their other little birds, they find that these birds aren't living very long. And that the problem for birds in these cold climates is that there's not many insects in winter. So often the birds, they're migrating from Northern Europe down into um, Africa. And a lot of birds die. You know, these, these are difficult journeys. So the birds tend not to live very long. Now, once we get away from that really cold area of cold climates, you find that um, a lot of birds, they're not migrating. They can live in the one area. And, um, but they just live longer. And so the situation we have in Australia is that <clears throat> we have terrible droughts. Uh, so the climate, we, you know, we have, we're more inclined to have droughts in Australia than anywhere else in the world. I don't, can you hear the crows calling in the background yes. now? Yeah, I'm yeah, wondering yeah. what that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's our Theresian, Theresian crows. So they, they also roost here. So we have a roost with Theresian crows, uh, corallas, soft crested cockatoos and rainbow lorikeets. So um, yeah, you, probably, you might be, if we're still talking, how do we spell in while, you might... Because this is a podcast, people will listen to it. So, Torres. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so it comes from Torres Strait. So, um, Torres was a, I think he was a Portuguese explorer who sailed between New Guinea and Australia, discovered Torres Strait, and it's named after him. So, yeah, Torresian just means 
they're in New Guinea and Northern Australia. Yeah, I, I always think, what are they saying to each other? They, they call for hours some, some, some times of year. Um, why are they long-lived? Okay, so, so, yeah, yeah, so why are they long-lived? Um, so yeah, we found that, um, our, I mean, this could actually be true in India as well. I mean, I'm, uh, sometimes these findings, they reflect how much research is done. Actually, I must say, I went out on, I was banding with some, with the, well, it was called the Bomb, I think the Bombay Natural History Society was the name at the time, and maybe it's been it's renamed a, now. It's but, Yeah, okay, that's yeah. good. Yeah, so I made, I made friends with them, and I went banding with them right down in the south where they used local, um, the, the people who, who set up the mist nets for them, they were ones who caught, caught waders for food, and they were, they were uh, uh, banding, banding bulls, I think it was. But um, yeah, so maybe um, maybe songbirds. I'm sure some of the songbirds in India are quite long lived as well because you don't have the really difficult winters. But I think I mean I think in India you have a very harsh dry season in a lot of parts of India, and so harsh dry seasons they will often drive migrations. Now in Australia, we don't have such harsh dry season <clears throat> over most of Australia, but also we have very very infertile soils. So, I mean, my answer will be complicated, but I'm assuming that the people listening to your podcast, they're smart they're, so that they can travel with me in terms of this journey of explanation. So in Australia, we don't have a tectonic plate inside the country. So if you think of the Himalayas, you've got two plates joining, pushing up big volcanoes. So there's a lot of soil being produced. So the, the rivers coming out of the Himalayas, they're bringing a lot of soil. So the Ganges, Indus, there's a lot of fertile soil coming down. In Australia, we don't have anything like that. We do in New Guinea. So Australian plate, it's struck the Pacific plate, it's pushed up big mountains in New Guinea, but we don't have anything like that in Australia. And so uh, there's been a lot of leaching of the soil. So <clears throat> for a very long time in Australia, the rain's been hitting the land, it's been washing nutrients into the sea and our soils are very, very poor. So if you look at Australia and the United States, we are nearly the same size if you leave out Alaska. But the United States, they have like 200, I think 250 million people in Australia. We have 25 million in Australia, only one tenth of the human population in nearly the same area of land. So why is there such a big difference? It's one big reason is the soil is just not fertile. So they have the big corn belt in the middle of America, Kansas, these states growing all that corn on really rich, fertile soil, whereas our soil is really, really poor. Now, where you have really poor and fertile soil and that you don't have a really hard dry season, <clears throat> the plants, they do not shed their leaves. They are not deciduous. So I was in, I was in Gear Forest and I saw, you know, the, the tick trees, you know, these are really deciduous trees. So if you're dropping your leaves, you're losing nutrients in those leaves. So the tree, they withdraw nutrients before they drop the leaves, but they still lose some nutrients in the fallen leaves. Our eucalypts, they are evergreen trees. So we, we have hardly any deciduous trees in Australia. And so that makes Australia very different from India and very different from North America, very different from Europe, very different from a lot of um, Africa where you will get leaf drop in the dry season. Now, if, you have, if your trees have leaves all year, they have insects on them all year. And so our birds can stay in these forests and not have to migrate because the leaves are still there in the dry season, the leaves are still there in winter, there are still insects in winter. So you can have birds that are maintaining their territories. I'm sorry, this is really quite complicated. No, oh, I, I get it, it I understand, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so the birds are there all the year round and that means they can have really complicated social systems. So um, the main bird I have outside here, I can't hear them calling, but they're noisy miners. So these are honey eaters. I mean, they're not actually going right out in the deserts, but they have 
really complicated social systems. They have colonies of like 200 birds. And so they can do that. You can have really complicated societies where you have evergreen foliage. I mean, if the trees shed their leaves and you have to go away for half the year, that's really limiting the possibilities for social organisation in the birds. It really is limiting them. If, if you can live there year round, you can have really complicated societies, you can live much longer. And so I think that's where um, long, longevity comes in. If you have evergreen vegetation, that helps. And, and so, yeah, we, we have helpers. The birds are there all year round. The young birds, they will often stay with the parents rather than being driven away. And they will help the parents bring up their young and that they are acquiring life skills. And so that when one of the parents dies, often one of the um, sons or daughters, he will take the place of the mother or the young. And that would be incest. You know, it would be a father and a mother having sex together, but that doesn't happen because um, there's really high levels of infidelity in Australian birds. And so they will actually sneak off and mate with some other bird to avoid incest happening. And so that's part of the social complexity that I talk about in the book. Okay, I, I so that... No, thank you. It's a, it makes perfect sense, I think. Um, and like you said, we followed the journey. And I can hear something in the background. Maybe they are the noisy miners. Or... That is a noisy miner. Yeah, that, chook, 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 yeah. chook. that is a noisy miner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So when that's I, possible. You can say, yeah. When I visited New South Wales, um, uh, people said this word and I thought it was spelled to, uh, like how we spell M Y N O R, yes. but it's actually it M I N O R. Yeah. It comes, it comes from your word because people, so you've got the yellow wattle around the eye, just like, um, well, we, we call them um, common miners. Or when I was young, we called them Indian miners. So that was the yes. name for them. So birds imported from India to control pests in the sugarcane fields. And so, so yes, they, they look like those, firstly, because they had the yellow around the eye, also because they were quite noisy, a bit aggressive. So yeah, the spelling is different, but the derivation of the word is the same. Oh, so the noisy miners were imported from India. I mean, they were Indian miners that you took uh, to Australia. Is that the origin? No, not the, well, the noisy miners that you can hear outside, that's a honey eater. So okay. that's a native okay. Australian bird. Yes, but we also, yeah, we also have the common Indian miners, and they they are also. I can also hear them from here, not not calling now, but they are breeding nearby. So they they were brought, um, yeah, a hundred like more than a hundred years ago from um, from India, yeah, to because in the belief that they would eat pests in the sugarcane fields. Um, you point out some distinctive birds in your book, and can we talk about them briefly? Like the magpies, for example, you talk about. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've got a magpie sign here, so the, these are possibly. Um, oh, yeah. Wow. So we, we get these signs. So this sign, I found it on the ground in my house. I think this is a, for people who are listening to it, it says, warning, magpie swooping. Magpie's nest is in this area and may swoop passersby. This is normal defensive behavior during the breeding season and last up to, lasts up to six weeks. To protect yourself, walk quickly through the area. Don't run. Wear a hat or carry an umbrella. Bike riders, dismount and walk. Never deliberately provoke or harass a magpie as this makes them more defensive. This is sort of like our Indian monkeys. And uh, we, we, we have a <laughs> Yeah, that's time. right. Yeah, and so um, they, um, the, the aggressive birds we've had. So I've got, I can see these signs. I mean, I can just walk um, 10 meters from here, look out and see these signs on trees. And so um, they are a problem all over <laughs> Australia that. They will get very aggressive. They'll have the nests high up in eucalyptus trees. And the males, they, I mean, the, I talked to my neighbours. There was a woman living next door with three young children. I said, why are there magpie signs here? They're not attacking me. And she said, oh, they're attacking my children. And so I'd see her children going for a walk, carrying a stick. And so these, mag, these magpies, sometimes they will decide that 
there's someone they don't like. So some, somebody has walked near them and they've done something a bit suspicious. They're very, very intelligent birds. But particularly the, um, the, the people who deliver letters, they, they come along on motorbikes and they get really upset by those. And so it's a really big problem for the post office. And so the post office in Australia, they employed a bird expert, a, a friend of mine and said, what do we do? Well, how can we stop these magpie, magpie attacks? So um, that it has been said by um, American biologists that these are the most aggressive birds in the world because you, in spring in Australia, you will have more than 100 parks, probably more than 200 parks in Australia where it's a little bit dangerous to walk in certain areas because a magpie will dive down. Now, what they usually do is they'll snap, snap right beside your ear or beside your head. And the first time it happens, you think, what, what was that? What was that? But because it's happening every year, you, you very quickly realise, okay, that's a magpie. Sometimes the first time you know, they'll actually peck on your neck or your ear. And they're very strong birds. So these are very big songbirds. And so they will stab you, get a bit of blood. And then you look around and the magpie is up there. And so you quickly get out of that area. And so what people will do is either carry a stick or cross the road, or there'll be parts of parks where no one wants to walk because they've got signs like the one I just showed you on there. Actually, that, that's what you can hear now. I can see a noisy miner. And so there's a fledgling chick. It's saying, feed me, feed me. That's the please feed me call. Um, can you talk about parrots and how Australian parrots are different from South American ones? Yeah, well, um, I mean, South America has got more parrots than us. And so if you think of what are the continents that are really rich in parrots, it's very much Australia and South America. And this fits with the Gondwanan origin. So the um, DNA evidence is really saying that parrots started out in Australia. Some of them traveled through Antarctica when it was still joined to Australia. It was still had forests and they got into South America and were very, very successful there. So South America has more parrots than us <clears throat> and has bigger parrots than macaws. They are larger, <clears throat> but we do have more diversity of parrots. And so the behavior is also more versatile. So we have these um, uh, you know, ground parrots. We have a parrot that hides in low heathlands. It comes out at night, <clears throat> runs along on the ground and eats seeds. We have a night parrot. It's a nocturnal parrot. It was thought to be extinct. No one saw them. No one saw them for more than 50 years. And so they're out in the desert areas. <clears throat> they're only feeding at night. Um, they're doing all their feeding on the ground. And so these are quite strange parrots. Then, of course, you have cockatoos. Of course, everybody knows cockatoos. Incredibly loud. I think, you know, the call of a very angry a cockatoo, the, 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 the volume of sound, that, ah! I mean, it's an unbelievable volume of sound. And, you know, I think that that is really extreme. And um, we have black black cockatoos, <clears throat> and the black cockatoos, they eat a lot of witchetty grubs. So Aboriginal people, to get witchetty grubs, they would use an axe. They would chop into the side of a tree, pull out the grub and eat it. Now, the black cockatoos, they're using their beak, and they can bite into quite large trees. And um, they will sometimes destroy a young tree, so a tree that might be, might be about that thick, so the size of my arm, they will bite into that to get to the grub and the tree will just fall over. So they're getting a grub that might be as thick as my thumb and they're destroying the tree. But the tree, the tree will grow back because we've had cockatoos in Australia for tens of millions of years. The trees are adapted, the witchetty grubs are adapted. It's all a very um, good system. So I've seen the tree that um, was totally chopped off by a cockatoo, the tree, top of the tree fell over. Then the tree sprouted about six young shoots and one of those grew into a new tree. And now five years later, you can't tell that the cockatoo is there. And so I'm thinking that um, here we have 
very ecologically powerful birds. You know, they are they are have capacity to do amazing damage to trees. And and this has been written about on forestry plantations, you know, like young forestry plantations, they've had a problem of cockatoos destroying lots of their trees. Um, this is the point we were leading up to, which is when where you say uh, Australia is distinctive because birds influence not, they influence the whole ecology in a way that is perhaps more pronounced than in other continents. Would that be a fair thing? Yes. Yeah. And how yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And the other really big example of talking about noisy miners, and so they have a, as a close relative bell miners. Now, a lot of Australians would just call them bellbirds. So they have this beautiful tink, 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 very quite musical call. Now these have these really big colonies. You can get two hundred birds in one colony, and they are very, very aggressive. Like noisy miners, they drive out all the other birds. And they, they're specialised to feed on lerp. So this is a little bit complicated. So you have little sap-sucking bugs. They're like aphids, the same size as an aphid. But they make, from some of the sugar that they suck out, they make a little sugary cap over their bodies. I, I can show a picture of it in my book. And um, the bell miners live on these little sugary caps and, and on the, the insects. But they because they're so good at pushing other birds away, the forests that they're protecting, they build up so much of these solid bugs, so much alert, that the trees get sick because there's so much sap being sucked out of them that you get forests dying, forests dying because of bell miners. And so this is, this is a, a, a serious problem for the forestry department in New South Wales that they are losing large areas of young forest because of native birds. It's called BMAD, B-M-A-D, Bell Miner Associated Dieback. It's worthwhile looking it up online because when I talk about it, it doesn't really sound believable, but you can, you can easily read about it online. So, so that they, I've got large areas where they thought they were going to get all this wood for, um, you know, to be able to sell. But in actual fact, they've just got dead trees because of birds. In India, we have a lot of pigeons, the rock pigeons, and you talk about them in your book as well. Um, um, pigeons and then honey eaters as well. Um, what can you tell us about them? So with, with, with pigeons, it's a more, um, it's not as clear cut a picture. So I talked about how we know that um, songbirds and parrots came out of Australia. So that all, all experts agree with that. There's no one disagreeing with that. Pigeons, it looks like they also come from Gondwana, from the southern continent. So we have the oldest pigeon fossils have come out of Australia, and we have pigeons fossils from two different parts of Australia that are both older than pigeon fossils from anywhere else. If you look at the DNA evidence and say, what is the oldest group of pigeons the DNA evidence is saying these are South American. So if you look at that evidence, that would suggest that pigeons are also a Gondwanan group. So if that is true, it would mean that Australia and South America have been giving pigeons to the rest of the world. But I don't want to push that too hard because if you look at the DNA trees of pigeons, it's, it's very confusing. So it's um, not, not as obvious as it is with, um, with parrots and songbirds. I mean, I think your second part of your question about <clears throat> honey eaters, I mean, birds that feed, ne feed on nectar, a lot of different birds will feed on nectar. Um, and so um, honey eater is the name for the, the main Australian group of birds that does that. And they're only in Australia, but with some in New Guinea and some in Indonesia. So some have spread out of Australia. But you can talk about honey eating birds, and that could mean baubles, sunbirds, lots of other birds, but that would not be a, um, it would not be a scientific term. In your book, uh, you talk about genetic evidence and fossil evidence and how they point to different things. That was a little hard to understand. And we can, um, is there a way you can simplify it for us? Um, yeah, okay. So early on, you talked about the Hoatzin. So that's the bird in the Amazon, which is really spectacular because they crawl around in the trees. They've got odd hooks on their arms. 
and that they are in a family of their own, they don't have any relatives. And so people have said, well, it is clear that this bird, it's only found in South America, so it must have evolved in South America. But then people found Huatzin fossils in France, in Europe. And so um, that seemed unbelievable, but the same kind of thing has happened before. So Europe has got the best record of fossils. They're just fantastic finds of fossils in Europe. India has not produced very good bird fossils. In Australia, it's getting better. Uh, Africa is a very poor record of bird fossils. And this is a real problem because <clears throat> when we try and understand the fossil record, because that's one way of trying to work out where birds come from, we find that Europe and North America have the best bird fossil records. And when we look at these fossils, so I, lots of... Sorry to interrupt. In, in India and Africa, the poor record is because of temperature and geography, or is it because of that human intervention has not happened to find them? No, well, uh, that, that's quite a good question. I think um, part of the problem is geology. So I, I said Australia didn't have very good fossil record because we are very flat. We don't have, you know, you, you would have, I mean, I think we've all seen pictures of the places in America where they found the dinosaur fossils and you have these really big cliffs that are eroding cliffs. So you want to have lots of cliffs like that. And I mean, India has produced some very good um, um, mammal and reptile fossils. And Pakistan has some really good fossil beds. Um, but sometimes those fossil beds are not good for bird fossils because the bird fossils are very delicate, so they don't preserve easily. And so I'm not sure, I, don't, I actually can't answer your question for India, whether people need to look more or whether the geology is the problem. It's, it's pro I'm sure the geology is the problem. If there were really good bird fossils, people would find them, but you never know what they will find in future. Okay, so if we get back to um, Europe, they find bird fossils of trogons. There's no trogons in Europe now. They find bird fossils of parrots. There are no parrots in Europe now. And so when they found the Hoats, and that was a big surprise, but they also, you know, they also have been finding the other bird groups they haven't got. And so one of the ways to explain what's happened is if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, we know from plant fossils as well that if you go back, say, 20 million years in Europe, it had beautiful rainforests. And so it had beautiful rainforests, there were parrots, there were trogons, there were these other, other what you call tropical birds. But then the climate got worse, the ice ages came in, there was a lot of massive, massive extinctions. And so if you look at, I'd say mouse, mouse birds are another example I've talked about. <clears throat> If you look at mouse birds today, they are a group that's only in Africa, but their fossils have been found in America, in North America. Um, some of the birds that are only in Madagascar, their birds have been found in Europe. Um, so it's a very complicated question where if you just look at where birds are today, you have all these groups that are only in the Southern Hemisphere. So you could say these birds probably evolved on Gondwana in the southern, you know, they evolved in the southern hemisphere, they're only southern group, but the fossils are saying something very different. And so you have to uh, look at both the DNA tree. So if you do a DNA tree, you can only use living birds. You can't use a 20 million year old fossil to get DNA, you can't get DNA from it. So when people do these DNA trees, they end up saying all of these bird groups are southern hemisphere. Um, Whereas if you look at the fossil record only, you could say that all these bird groups are northern. So there is a, a there has been a, a lot of fighting between fossil people saying birds come from the north, um, DNA people saying a lot of these birds come from the south, and some DNA people have said that all birds come out of South America. And so you have these debates going on, which I talk about in my book, but it's actually a bit too complicated to. Uh, explain it all in this talk because yeah. I could spend half an hour talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just want to move to um, 
if you, the, I have four more questions. One is about the link between New Guinea to Australia, which you talked about a little bit. So if you want to move on, we can. And then I wanted- yeah, Maxine, to... I, yeah. Sorry, I, go I, ahead. I would like to talk about that because yeah, I think it's really important to understand Australia used to be mostly covered in rainforests. So you've only got to go back uh, three or four million years and there was rainforests in places that are now very, very dry. <clears throat> And so as Australia got drier and drier and drier, the rainforest, it stayed along the east and it kept some of the rainforest birds. But if you go to New Guinea, that is really, really rich in rainforest birds. And a lot of those bird groups, they were surely in, in Australia back in time. So for me, New Guinea is what Australia looked like five, 10, 15 million years ago. It's got a lot of bird groups that would have been in Australia. So it's very important to count New Guinea as part of the Australian continent. And one way to really understand that is if you think about, okay, mainland Australia has Tasmania underneath the island of Tasmania, and then it's got the island of New Guinea to the north. Well, if sea level goes up and down over time, when you get an ice age, Australia and Tasmania join up as one part of a continent. New Guinea also joins up to mainland Australia. If you go back 20,000 years, they were all part of one land. But the water channel between Tasmania and the mainland is deeper than the channel between mainland Australia and New Guinea. So New Guinea, stays connected to mainland Australia for longer than Tasmania. So how can we talk about Tasmania as part of Australia and not count New Guinea? That's politics. That's not geography. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, and that actually has powerful ramifications for bird life, which is what you talked about earlier, yes. which is the yeah. link between the, the yes. bird paradise. Yeah. You have to think through time. If you want to understand nature, you have to think through time. Now is just one point in time. You have to think, well, what was it like 5,000, 10,000, 20,000? You have to think through time. 20,000 years ago, that's nothing, you know? Evolution goes in millions of years. All the species we have today are hundreds of thousands of years old. Most of them are more than a million years old. When I say that New Guinea was part of Australia 20,000 years ago, that's only yesterday. That's nothing. We have to, we have to count that in our thinking, not say New Guinea is separate. It's separate right now. It wasn't separate yesterday. Yeah, that's true. And um, so uh, your book is about birdsong, and it would be lovely to hear you talk about the biases and misconceptions that we have about birdsong and specifically as it relates to Australia and the Southern Hemisphere? Yeah, well, the thing was that, um, you know, the English, they colonized Australia, as of course they colonized India, and they were homesick. They thought these birds, they sound terrible. You know, they're hearing the parrots screaming, <clears throat> they're hearing the honey is giving these aggressive calls. Now, there were also lyrebirds giving beautiful Calls. There are whistlers giving beautiful calls. So we have the really beautiful birds, as I, as I mentioned before. But they were so homesick that they said the birds sound terrible in Australia. So they brought out nightingales. They released nightingales in Melbourne. They didn't survive. They brought out um, larks. And, and we, do, we do have larks in Australia that they introduced. But but, you know, they, they weren't willing to accept that we have beautiful songbirds in Australia. But I start off my book by actually saying, well, you know, they were quite right to complain. There are some terrible bird calls here, you know, if you want to think in terms of music. But, you know, when, as I say, when you get the live birds, they're really good. And so, yeah, there was a lot of bias there in terms of thinking that. Um, and I suppose if it's, say, about Europe versus Asia and Australia, one really big difference is that you can get the situation in spring in North America, Northern Asia and Australia where the birds, they've migrated south for winter. So the songbirds have come back. They come back 
just before the trees are producing their leaves, the males, they want to establish their territories. And you can have the situation of all these songbirds calling out, calling out to females. And you can have this beautiful, beautiful songbird system going on. So in one of David Attenborough's TV series, he walks about in a leafless beach or elm forest and, and he says, listen, you know, there's this and there's this. And it is, it is quite beautiful. And you don't get that anywhere else. I, I, I don't think you do because the, the, the songbirds, they've got this narrow band of time in which to breed. You know, you've had a really hard winter with no insects. They've come back in spring. They want to quickly get a territory, get a mate, quickly get their young going so they can all fly south in autumn. And so you do get this really concentrated band of singing. And that's uh, uh, something you'll get in, um, say, in chi China. Uh, you won't get it in California, but you'll certainly get it in New York State. So, you know, Cornell, Cornell Lab of Ornithology invited me to give a talk. And it was so kind of them. They invited me at the exact time when this was happening. So I got to see all the, all the warblers. And I was with a local ornithologist and saying, these are... A lot of these birds, they've only turned up in the last week. They, they weren't here a week ago. And so, yeah, I was hearing this. I'm saying that you do not get this in Australia. And, yeah, I've done a lot of bird watching in Southeast Asia. There's nothing like that there. If I understand you right, you're, you're saying, you're saying that saying. the spread of uh, musicality in songbirds is because uh, they are able to stay in one place, whereas those in colder climates have to cut. Uh, sort of compress their showing off their musical ship in a way. That, that's exactly true. And I don't, I don't know enough about bird watching in India, but I would think that if you've got, say, a deciduous teak forest, you're not going to hear a lot of bird calls when the trees are leafless. The calling will be when they've, when they've got their leaves. Yes. Here, these trees are evergreen. So I don't, actually don't notice a really big difference in bird calls any time of year. I mean, I'm sure there are definite differences, but for me, I never think, oh, it's the time of year when birds call. There's a lot of constant, constant calling going on. Um, the last few questions are about uh, Australia's charismatic birds. Which ones uh, would you pick out? And I also have a few names. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we've got the, um, the lyrebird on our 10 cent coin. So um, that's... You know, a very, very popular bird. Um, I think in North Queensland, the cassowary. So um, if you think of the world's biggest birds, I mean, the ostrich is biggest. Now, people will say, no, there are two species of ostrich. So, okay, if we accept two, then the third and fourth biggest birds in the world are the emu and the cassowary in Australia. Emus are taller, but cassowaries way more. And that can be dangerous birds. And so, I think um, they will come into people's gardens in North Queensland. A lot of people feed them. It's illegal to feed them, but a lot of people do it. And that's a very, very charismatic bird. So um, if you travel in that area, you see Cassowary Sign, Cassowary Cafe, Cassowary Coast, Cassowary Hotel, very, very, very big. I mean, I, mean, I think one of my favourite birds are the black cockatoos, that they are big, smart birds. The white, the white cockatoos, they're, they're, they're a, bit too, a bit too loud. The black cockatoos are more restrained, they're more dignified. Um, and you look at them and think, you're a really, really smart bird and you're just looking at me and there's a lot of intelligence as we look at each other. And then I think, you know, the magpie, they are a very charismatic, popular bird, even though they are so aggressive. Uh, last question is, when I was a kid in India, we have this song that we learned about the kookaburra, laughing kookaburra. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about your, uh, what do you think? I mean, I know you write about it, but... Uh... Yeah, no, I mean, the kookaburra is funny. So it's, it's the world's biggest kingfisher. And so you could say, well, why does Australia have the world's biggest kingfisher? So I really wanted to be able to say something important about that. But I, I couldn't actually find any any particular reason. So kingfishers did not evolve in Australia. <clears throat> They're part of a group that fits in with rollers and um, what other birds, uh, I think, uh, beaters. So they're, they're, not a, they're not an Australian group, they're, but they've done very well in Australia. 
but yeah, the, the laughter of a kookaburra that, um, I mean, they, they call a lot quite here. You know, they, they haven't actually called while I've been talking, but um, they are very much an iconic bird. And um, yeah, that um, kookaburra call, I mean, <laughs> in a sense, you think uh, you ask me a lot of questions as an expert on Australia and I try and have an answer, but you know, nature, it's ultimately a mystery. And I think it's always good to be able to say some of it stays a mystery. And so if you say, tell me, what is the mystery of the kookaburra? I'll say to you, I don't know. <laughs> some, of it, some of it stays a mystery. And I like that. I know I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I don't know the answer. For some this, of these questions. This, I mean, this these lines are so lyrical, it would be perfect to end it here. But I, as you were talking, I, I had a question that I want to end with. So you said when you're, suppose I was a beginning ornithology student and you had this wonderful line where you said you have to look through time, you should sort of look beyond geographies to New Guinea and uh, Australia. So when you address students of ornithology, how does Tim Lowe think? What are some of the frameworks that you have learned and that you think is a good way to think about ornithology? Um, uh, or... I, I suppose I think that um, <clears throat> it's bouncing between what you read and what you see and hear. And so if you want to be good as an ornithologist, obviously, you have to go out and look at birds. But if you just try and understand everything by looking and listening, that's, that's not good enough. You also have to study, you have to read a lot. But if that was all you did, you wouldn't be any good either. You could read all the scientific literature, but then you go into a forest and you fall over a log, you don't really understand anything. So I think that um, it is for me, back and forth, back and forth, It's when I see something, I go and I read about it. I say, what did I see? What have, what have other people said about this? So what have other people seen? What have other people heard? So it is moving, well, yes, moving back and forth through time, moving back and forth through geography, but also moving back and forth between what have I learned and what can I learn from what other people have seen? And in terms of the literature, you know, you can have the best journals that you can go to you know you can read about birds in science and nature proceedings of the national academy of sciences these top journals but there's also the local nature journals the little nature clubs and you might think this is not very good quality work but often that gives you some of the best information because they're saying i saw a bird doing something really strange and you would never get that into a top journal but that can be, ah, yeah, I saw the same thing. This is helping me understand it. And so I think that's, that is a key to it, is to um, build on your own what you see with, with what you can read. And as, as somebody who has thought through time and geography, which is a continent that you find fascinating as somebody who loves birds? I mean, oh, which, yeah. do you, which would you like to go back to, or is it Australia? <laughs> uh, I, actually, I really... Uh, Look, they're, all, they're already gone. I mean, I'd, I'd be perfectly happy. I'd be perfectly happy in Asia. Um, I mean, Af Africa really. I suppose Africa. The mammals are so dazzling, and then then the the birds are, are really remarkable as well. So I think you know, Africa really stands out as the continent for um, for, for 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 you know for for wildlife. But I mean, they're all really good. That's not a. It's not a. It's not a good question. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, Asia, Asia is where I've spent more time outside Australia, you know, a lot more than a year. I've invested a lot in trying to understand Australia through understanding Asian birds. And that's a really, really yeah. good comment. Yeah, you're me. right. That's not, a fair, that's not a fair question at all. But for, for me, it would be South America because everybody says that's where all the birds are. And I have not For me, there's, there's too many birds in South America. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. But thank you so much, uh, Tim Lowe, for talking to us. Thank you, Shova, for asking so many, so many questions for being so <laughs> interested. But it's great, isn't it? Birds are great. We, we love them. Yeah. We want them to survive. So, uh, thank you. Bird Podcast is produced by Ulla Sanand and Eco Edu. I'm Shobha Narayan. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching.